Well, good afternoon. I hope that today has been a good day for you, especially with this being the Lord's Day. And I hope that you've been able to join with uh, Christian brethren and uh, to worship and praise God and encourage each other. And I'm glad we could spend some time in God's Word today. If you want to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew as we continue on Sunday afternoon in go the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Matthew 26. And we're going to pick up in verse 17. Now, this is after we had seen Jesus predicting some things in chapters 24 and 25, and it got done saying these things. And then earlier in chapter 26, as we saw last week, the Jewish leaders began to secretly plot against Jesus and wanting to kill him. And then we had seen the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. Um, and a beautiful uh, love and honor that was shown him there. And as Jesus said, this was a, an anointing, a preparation for his burial. Jesus knowing that his death was getting close. Um, and then sadly, we saw in verses 14 through 16 that uh, Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' uh, closest special disciples, uh, Judas for the sake of money, agreed to betray Jesus uh, to help the Jewish leaders get to Jesus in a uh, secret way. And so the plot was set against him. And now today we pick up then in verse 17. When in verse 17 we are told that when the first day of the week had come, that it was the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, on the first, uh, sorry, on the first day of... Let me get my, my words here right now, the first day of the week. But on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When the evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. And so Jesus, it is time for the feast of the Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread. Uh, Jesus getting ready with his disciples. The disciples are getting it prepared. They get everything set and ready to go. They get the location, the place, and all the preparations made there. They sit down for this Passover feast together. In verse 21, though, that as they were eating the Passover together, that as Matthew is focusing on and laying this out for us, that he says that Jesus then tells the disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. I mean, Jesus just comes out and says it. Um, he doesn't name the person, but, you know, he says, one of you. I mean, imagine all the disciples hearing this. I mean, you would think, you know, Judas Iscariot hearing this would have really been freaked out because, uh, you know, he knew what he was already going to do. The other disciples hearing this would have been, were very concerned. And, you know, Jesus just tells them, one of you is about to betray me. And so then, verse 22, we do read that they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to Jesus, Lord, is it I? You know, imagining all of them then asking Jesus one by one or at the same time. They all want to know, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? I mean, you know, there's only one person out of them all that we know had already determined to do this. So even imagine the disciples thinking, could it be me? Would I do that? You know, are you saying that I'm going to end up doing that? You know, maybe the disciples, you know, they're thinking much like Peter's going to do that. Listen, no, I'm not, I'm not, I want to do that. But could it be? They began asking, Lord, is it I? So Jesus answered and said, verse 23, the one who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Jesus 
you know, giving a hint, giving a clue as to who the betrayer indeed was. But then Jesus said, yes, this is what's supposed to happen. This is what's going to happen. The Son of Man is uh, going just as it was been prophesied, just as it was said of him. But when you think about it, think about the one who's doing that. Think about, you know, the one who betrays Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus says it would have been better for that person never to have been born. Such a bad, horrible, awful thing to do and to be guilty of. And then Judas says, or Judas, we're told, who is betraying Jesus, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And Jesus said to him, you have said it. I mean, imagining, you know, Judas, you would think maybe, I, mean, I don't know, kind of see it both ways. Maybe he would just keep his mouth shut or maybe he's trying to play it off like, oh, is it me? Oh, no. I'm. But he asks the question, is it I? And Jesus affirms it by saying, you have said it. And just as you have said it, Judas, you know, you know it. Apparently, Jesus knows it. But yes, Judas was indeed the one who was going to betray Jesus. G Judas, one of the ones who had been with Jesus and the other disciples teaching and preaching and hearing all that Jesus was doing and or all that Jesus was teaching and seeing all that he was doing, even, you know, the disciples, Judas performing miracles and such. But now Judas is willing to betray Jesus over a handful of silver. Again, Judas struggling with his greed, his covetousness, his lust for physical things. And he is the one who is going to betray Jesus. Although the disciples, even in the other accounts, the other disciples, they never kind of catch this. They never figure it out. Uh, you know, I know in another gospel, as we'll see when we study that gospel account, uh, you know, Judas goes out. The disciples think, well, he's just going to, you know help the poor, or get what we need, or whatever the case may have been. But now Judas was going to betray Jesus. What it is on this occasion, as they are partaking of the Passover, and as Jesus has now declared that he is going to be betrayed, and then verse 26, we are told that as they were eating, another thing Jesus did, not only did he pronounce that he was going to be betrayed, but Jesus in the Passover took the bread, took the unleavened bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the, disciple, to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins." But I say to you that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus, as they're gathered together, they're eating the Passover together. And Jesus uses this time, he uses this format and setting, uses the Passover to choose his own memorial supper. The Lord's Supper, he Jesus takes some of the unleavened bread and he says for the disciples to, to take it and to eat it, that this is in you know, his body, that he is there to do this, remembering or you know, knowing this is Jesus' body. And that's what the Lord's Supper would become, remembering that, you know, remembering the body that Jesus gave and all that he suffered and his, uh, on his uh, suffering and death on the cross. Drink from the cup, the fruit of the vine the, uh, that they were given that they were to drink from, remembering the blood of Jesus that was shed for us, the blood of the new covenant that Jesus was establishing in his death and his blood, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And that is what Jesus instituted. That's what we partake of today. The unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, we do so in remembrance as we have been commanded and instructed elsewhere to remember Jesus, to remember his body and blood, his death and uh, the price that was paid so that we could be forgiven, the wonderful grace and mercy of God through Jesus and his sacrifice. And Jesus says that he would not eat of this uh, drink of the fruit of the vine until the day he drinks it new in my Father's kingdom. And there's a couple ideas there. One being, I mean, you know, maybe what Jesus was referring to there was how when we partake of the Lord's Supper today, we are 
spiritually communing with Jesus. Uh, we are partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, and in doing so, we are communing with God, we are communing with Christ. And that could be what it refers to, or it could be Jesus referring to the day when we are all in eternity, when we are all in heaven. I don't think then Jesus would literally mean that we'll be drinking the fruit of the vine in heaven, but it does speak to our fellowship together when we do get to heaven. Either way, um, we have this communion with the Lord now and in eternity. We have this fellowship through his blood, through his body. And so this is what Jesus established there, knowing his death was coming. It is what we are still doing today to remember what Jesus has done for us. And this is what Jesus gave his disciples. And so they had then sung a hymn together and then went out to the Mount of Olives, where they often spent time together. We'll get in. That's where we're going to stop for today. And so we'll pick up, Lord willing, next week in verse 31 and see what happens next when they go out to the Mount of Olives and what took place there and in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're getting closer to when Jesus would be betrayed and be arrested and be rejected and killed. Let's remember all of this each day, and especially on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, as we Come together to remember Jesus and the Lord's Supper and to give God the glory and praise. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift, the gift of his Son. And let's give God that thanks and honor and love when we partake of the Lord's Supper. God bless.